Good afternoon, and welcome to one of the three SWIFT slots at this time session, so I'm glad you came here. Uh, this session is on how the uh, community and Red Hat and the Red Hat storage community uh, have been working together and putting uh, Swift on top of Gluster FS and the not as much as the technical we'll have talk about some technical overviews of how that actually happens but we're going to focus a lot on how do you actually work together in the community and, and commit to uh, really good community collaboration and as something that's been really nice leading up to this talk is I probably had six conversations yesterday with people around uh, the hallway and and whatnot just asking, well, how do we do this with Swift, and how do we do this with uh, Swift? Can we add this and all that kind of stuff? So it's really thing and a, a really good topic, and I think there's a lot of people here who are really interested in it. So by way of introduction, my name is John Dickinson. I'm the project technical lead for OpenStack Swift. I am the director of technology at SwiftStack, and with me is Luis Pabon. Hello, my name is Luis Pabon. I work for Red Hat Storage. <laughs> and he also works on something really cool called the oh, Cluster yeah, Swift Project. Yeah. We'll talk about that. <laughs> so I work for a company called SwiftStack. I said what we do, and to clarify, is that uh, we uh, are actively involved in Swift, but we don't have Swift itself. We, uh, we have a management and control plane that comes alongside of Swift and does that uh, to integrate it into existing places. So why are we here, and why does this actually all matter, and what's, what kind of problems are we solving? The reality of the world is that data has been exploding in its growth and at such a scale that you have to solve it, you can't get around it. Uh, it's not something that you can just ignore uh, because unstructured data especially has been uh, just growing at rapid, rapid amounts. You've got uh, changes in the way applications have been built, uh, which means that uh, people are deploying stuff on phones and mobile devices that are always connected and always generating new content. You've got video content that is getting at higher and higher resolution. And what this means is that you've got a problem of storing your data, and you have to effectively solve it. So. It's not just the applications that have changed as well. The IT infrastructure people who are deploying these storage solutions actually need something better than traditional, traditional storage because they need to be able to move into a world where they don't have these silos of storage. You want to be able to pool your storage. You want to be able to take advantage of cost savings and things like that. But you also want to be able to respond in a very rapid way as new applications come online and as the usage patterns change over time. So what you need is you need something that is going going to be able to uh, abstract away the actual storage media and actually give you the, um, uh, the agility and the cost that you need to do that. And that is what systems like Swift and like GlusterFS are doing, solving different problems for different use cases, but in the same common way of being able to abstract away the underlying storage media so that you can grow and deal with this massive problem in unstructured data. So. How, does, uh, how do we do this? How do we actually solve these problems? To start with, I'm going to go over a little bit about how Swift works and some use cases there. Then we're going to switch over and talk about how uh, Gluster is put together and some use cases there. And then we're going to show how the two have been kind of married together a little bit and have uh, cooperated, cooperate very well. So to start with, uh, this kind of fundamental pieces that are, I think are very important is that let's talk about what is Swift. How does it actually solve this problem of distributed object storage? So there's two big parts of Swift, and it's, it's a really simple design. You've got a proxy server, and you've got the storage server. The proxy server is responsible for implementing most of the Swift's API, and then coordinating all the communications with the storage nodes. The storage servers are responsible for actually storing the data on a hard drive someplace, or more generally, a storage volume. And so the client talks to the, to the proxy server, and then the proxy server talks to one or more storage servers, and the storage servers talk to a hard drive. That's basically how it works. So just to make sure you're paying attention, pop quiz, does the client ever have to deal with what hard drive something is stored on? No, good answer. It, this is my fourth time to talk about this this week, so some of you probably got uh, the cheat notes. Um, so that is absolutely right. The, the point here, the solution that we have is something that is uh, removing those hard problems of the siloed storage and allowing you to just simply treat it as a consumable resource. So let's talk about a couple of use cases. I've talked about this one a lot this week because I think it's so exciting, but I'll tell you again because not all of you have seen it. And if you have, you need to hear it again. Um, 
There was a news story recently. There was an airline that went missing in the Indian Ocean, and apparently it was a big deal. And they were never able to find it, but in order to uh, track where this might be and where it went down, one way to do that is look, say, okay, if it hit the water and it broke apart, then we need to maybe figure out where the debris went, and then we can, from that, figure out where the plane is. So it turns out that there's a site in Australia that was built out to do just this. You know, drop a little marker on the ocean and you can figure out what the debris field looks like in, from now to like 10 years out or something like that. It's a really cool thing. It's a really fun little app. It's a drift.org.au and you should just go play with it because it's fun. But it turns out that in the media storm of figuring out where the plane was, one of the newspapers got a hold of this website and it's like, hey guys, did you go check this out? Which of course meant that everybody went home and started clicking on it and playing with it and the servers promptly crashed. They just had a scaling problem. So it was a pretty simple architecture and they realized, you know, we could just add in more Nginx servers and increase our web servers. It's a known problem, you know how to scale that, we've been doing that for years. But then they realized, wait a minute, we're already storing the data in Swift. This is a, they've got some CSV files that load into the client-side application. And so you click on a point, it loads the right CSV file and renders it in the application. It's kind of, it's a pretty simple application. But loading all of that stuff was just overwhelming their, their, uh, their stored, I'm sorry, not their stored servers, their, uh, their web servers. So what they realized is that they could easily uh, just point the browser, the actual end user client, directly at the Swift cluster and load the data directly from there. Boom, problem solved. They don't have to worry about scaling out their web application servers just to deal with a concurrency problem on their storage. That's the, that's the kind of use case that Swift is designed for. So if you've got content on the web, stuff that you have this, you know, uh, a wide range of uh, access across it, that's the kind of thing that you need to solve for. So a couple other use cases just to show you uh, a few different things. Uh, Pac-12 is a sports broadcasting ne network. They're f filming hundreds of sporting events every year. And as you know, the resolutions on those are going up. Storage increase uh, requirements are going up as well. And they were using a traditional SAN. And so they have, um, they have number one, they have a migration problem that they have to deal with. Um, and number two, they've got to figure out how to take advantage of something that's going to be more available rather than throwing stuff into a tape archive, let's put it in the active storage and then we can not only lower our costs, but we can also get something that's more available and potentially increase revenues. Because now you have, you know, somebody wants to go look at a football game from 1994 or something like that. Well, you don't, it's not unavailable. It's not sitting on a shelf someplace. It's already actively stored in the Swift cluster, which means that somebody can just go load it right then as soon as it's needed. Um, and I want you to remember about the migration story. We're going uh, to that, come back to that as we move into the, um, the, the cluster world. Another one uh, that I want to talk about is somebody who was here that was this week, kind of on the other end of the spectrum, not necessarily the web content, but you've got uh, a lot of data centers on a single campus um, studying genomics and a lot of research data um, solving the pro hard problems around curing cancer and curing AIDS. And you've got this kind of file sharing problem of massive, massive data sets that have to be uh, stored durably because you can't recreate them and you've got to do a lot of computation on them and you've got to be able to read any, you know, any part of them at any time to do it. So um, this was something that there was a whole use case uh, a session earlier this week on uh, Fred Hutchison and how they were building out their Swift cluster for this. Um, but again, one of their problems is a migration problem on dealing with um, file access protocols. Um, and and how do you deal with that in, a, in an object storage world? So remember those two things. We've got stuff that needs to be highly available, highly durable, highly scalable, but we also have the problem of migration from legacy storage. So other users around the world that are using uh, Swift include you know, service providers and major people, the point, uh, the uh, major companies, uh, and the, the reason that I really want to point this out is because it demonstrates how Swift is being used not just as some uh, toy hobby website or just a project, uh, uh, an experiment someplace, but actually uh, implementing storage for crucial lines of business at major companies all around the world. So Swift is obviously part of the OpenStack project. 
and that's why we're here this week, of course. Uh, and so there are lots of ways that we participate in working with the rest of OpenStack here, uh, whether that's being a target for uh, backups from Cinder or loading uh, VM images from, uh, via Glance or being able to integrate with Keystone, the metrics and Solometer, and all of those other projects that are in the OpenStack um, in the OpenStack project, um, it's kind of playing well together with all of those. Now, the fun thing about Swift is that it is not intrinsically dependent upon your, your particular compute infrastructure, so that you can say, you know what, I've got a storage problem, and we can deploy this independently without needing necessarily to set up a neutron network or something like that. It's something, it, it's something that works very well on its own, and then it cooperates very, very well with the rest of the cloud infrastructure so that you can build out your applications exactly to what you need, both on the compute and the storage. And I want to talk, this is, this is where we get into something that I think is very important in how we're transitioning and, and being able to um, work very well in the Gluster community. So we've got something working in, the, uh, in progress in the Swift community right now called storage policies. Storage policies allow you to do three things. Uh, given your global set of hardware on your Swift cluster, you are able, uh, somebody is able to choose the ability to say what subset of hardware do I want to store that on? Once I choose the subset of hardware, I can choose how do I store it across that subset of hardware? Is it going to be replicated? Is it going to be erasure coded? What's the configuration parameters on those? How many replicas does it have? How many parity bits in our EC? And then finally, and this is the important piece that uh, Gluster has really been contributing back to and taking advantage of, is the abstraction to the volume itself. And this is where I want to talk about the extensibility of Swift. Remember, this is the parts of Swift and how it's put together. And so one of the major uh, extension extensibility points within Swift is at that last bottom layer. You've got the object servers or the storage servers talking to hard drives. That abstraction there is something that uh, you can extend and bring in your own implementation of a particular storage volume. And this is what we've seen happen time and time again in the community. And it really kicked off with a lot of the, uh, the Gluster Swift project. And so there's a f I want to talk about a few things. Uh, it would, I'll mention a couple that are there. We've got our uh, normal one in Swift that comes out of the box, which is, includes just talking to a local hard drive with a normal POSIX file system. We've seen other people uh, write things for Seagate's kinetic drives, which is a non-POSIX, no, non-block device. Uh, so it's a different, actually a fundamentally different protocol. And then the Zero VM team has been uh, using this to uh, tie together um, compute and storage so that you can do your compute exactly where your storage is. They had a presentation earlier today about that, uh, kind of really cool technology there. And then the last one, and the reason we're going to talking here today, is the uh, running Swift on top of Gluster FS volumes. And so that abstraction there is what allows Swift to be able to uh, ingest uh, different um, different sorts of storage volumes and then gives the users the freedom and flexibility and the choice to deploy on what they actually want to do. So, thank you very much, John. So now uh, we'll be talking about the integration between GlusterFS and Swift. So before we go ahead and start talking about that, let me introduce first a little bit about GlusterFS. GlusterFS is a distributed file system with normally file access. One of the things that it does is, uh, as being distributed, it has its own way of placing data on different nodes. It also exports, uh, what it does is it exports a set of directories on different nodes, combines them, and represents them to the user as a, what's called a volume. That volume can be accessed through different types of protocols. Uh, we have uh, SIFS protocol for Windows systems. We have NFS. Uh, we have a local Gluster uh, interface, which we used over Fuse. And we have other methods through APIs and things like that. But the GlusterFS community wanted another method of accessing the same data on their cluster. And that was object uh, interface. They decided to then use what Swift uh, use, they want to use Swift as a method of accessing the storage, the same files that you access through either NFS and SIFS. So now, one of the use cases that they were trying to uh, accomplish was something like this. Let's say, for example, you have a set of Swift uh, systems that you, you can use uh, object interface to place files, for example, video files that you take on your camera, your phone, 
you put them on your Gluster system, and then you have a set of VMs, for example, that can take those files and transcode them using a file interface, NFS or SIFS. You can then take those transcoded video files and place them back on the ClusterFS system and then export them again through the object interface. This works very well with something like, you know, you take a video with Facebook or Google, you place it on your, you upload it through your phone and then available to others at different bit rates. So this is the main use case that they wanted to accomplish. So let's go back to how was this accomplished back in 2012. <clears throat> Excuse me. The very first thing that they did, the Gluster, the Gluster FS community, was they would require the user to apply or install OpenStack Swift on their system, and then they would install a diff file on top of it. Okay? So there was no automated testing for this. There were zero developers really working on the OpenStack Swift community, and there was really only one developer on the GlusterFS community working on this, this patch, this diff file. Now, Dris, this was really a great idea to combine those two worlds, but really it was bad execution. All right? So let's kind of revisit again a year later, and we at Red Hat Storage, we took it, and we said, let's refocus this, okay? Let's refocus what we're trying to do here. We took the work that was done in the GlusterFS community and we, we took it out of that repo and we focused it more at to be integrated with OpenStack Swift. We then made a full CI system. We want to make sure that we supported all their interfaces. But more importantly, we made sure that we included development, developers into the OpenStack Swift community. And then we had some developers still work on the Gluster Swift uh, bridge, the, the glue, to export this object interface into GlusterFS. Go ahead. Good. So one of the things that we did uh, in Red Hat, as we in, were part and participated in the OpenStack Swift community, is we wanted a better method to to enhance the methods in OpenStack Swift to extend it further, extend the volume interface. So that way, we could have OpenStack Swift use ClusterFS as its volumes. There was a, a set of, of people that worked very closely with, with Red Hat and in, in the, uh, the project that were able to actually accomplish this. It's actually available now in OpenStack Swift. And not only does Cluster Swift use the system, but also there are others in the community that are actually leveraging this technology. Yeah, and so for example, like I mentioned earlier, it's the same example and the same extraction that was able to be used uh, by other people in the community and not just one vendor's proprietary extensions onto something. And so what this ended up being was a really great idea. And one thing I've told many people today, and I'm not uh, before, and I'm not at all uh, ashamed to say it at all, is that Red Hat Storage in this instance has, in my mind, set the bar for how to integrate with an upstream open source community. In this way, what they did is they identified where are the extension points that they need to take advantage of and start using those. And then they they, where they found those extension points lacking, they were able to contribute back upstream to, uh, to improve the project for everyone. And so this is absolutely the right way to interface with Swift and to uh, take advantage of the things that Swift offers. It is completely a different way than saying, like what you're doing in the past, I'm just going to re-implement the Swift API behind my own proprietary uh, code. In this way, you're working with the upstream community, and that's absolutely the right way to do it. Thank you, John. So but we can do better than that. Today, a few months ago, what we have done is we want to increase participation. We want to increase the involvement between Red Hat and OpenStack Swift. So one of the things that we are doing is saying, let's step back and let's look at the Gluster Swift technology itself. We step back and say, well, this technology is not really based on GlusterFS. It's really just talking to POSIX file system. So how can we increase community involvement and community collaboration? Well, let's rename the project what it really is trying to do. We're trying to make Swift go on top of file systems. As we do that, we also want to increase the amount of development from Red Hat in the community. 
So we are adding more developers into the OpenStack Swift community. And some of the those developers are now responsible for what we call Swift on file, which is the replacement for Gluster Swift. So like John said, and when he was talking about storage policies, one of the next goals for Swift on file as it transfers it transitions from Gluster Swift to Swift on file is to become a storage policy. As we become a storage policy, we now can extend a current OpenStack Swift deployment with file system based storage, like ClusterFS and in the near future NFS, and any other type of POSIX file based system, that, the storage systems. So the thing is that I love about this and the way this works and one of the reasons I'm very excited about uh, the storage policies and this being a particular application of that is that this allows people who have those migration problems. So remember back to Pac-12, remember back to Fred Hutch, they had this migration problem both with existing storage and also having to deal with the, the different protocol access to um, their new sort of storage. So what this means is that you would be able to use a, a Swift on uh, file, that project, that connector, um, to ingest a, an existing, for today, ClusterFS system, but even tomorrow, potentially an arbitrary NFS system that would say, this is my traditional storage. And now you can still take advantage of the storage you've already purchased, but as you grow out your your storage requirements, you can expand. You can ex, uh, you can build that out in the just traditional uh, normal way in the Swift world, using commodity servers and take advantage of the the global dispersion and cheap uh, cheap cost to deploy um, Swift clusters. So what this really uh, I, what I love about it, and I keep saying all week, is you know Swift is able to allow you the freedom that you need to exactly match your infrastructure to your use case. Exactly, thank you. So one of the things that we wanted to also bring up is the uh, collaboration of the project. Um, one of the things that, that made Swift on file possible and made the storage uh, policies also possible and, and so on is the ability to collaborate in the project together. We have different innovate, uh, ideas between different companies different developers. The only way to innovate, bring innovation into a certain open source project is to really bring that in, those ideas and collaborate together. We really need to start embracing that. And not only that, but this presentation is actually a collaboration between both of us. I mean, this is a type of collaboration that we really need in this project. And collaboration is really, really, you want to say something else? I'm just uh, saying I'm agreeing with you. It's yeah. incredibly important because <laughs> it's not just the new ideas that sharpen one another, but it's actually meeting the new use cases. If I'm sitting at my office somewhere and I'm typing on Swift codes, but I don't hear about your use case, then I'm not going to be able to make sure that Swift includes those sort of things and meets your needs. So the fact is having that collaboration um, as demonstrated by this particular, in this particular example, but expanded to all of the people who are here this week, that is the kind of things that make Swift better and OpenStack better. Exactly. Thank you. Awesome. And in collaboration is very important. And it's, it's hard to explain, but when everybody comes together and it starts innovating together, and then those ideas start coming together and people start talking, it's really, really awesome. How awesome is it? It's as awesome as a shark high-fiving a gorilla. It's that awesome. So please come join us. We've got, uh, take advantage of that extensing, uh, the existing extensibility, it contribute back where the extensibility is lacking and you need additional functionality. And that way we can all uh, take advantage of what's going on there. Um, now I think we have just a few, about seven more, five to seven more minutes so we can have some uh, questions. Uh, if you can, please line up behind the mic. Um, if you're not able to do that, I will repeat your question. And I see one right here in the front. Right, so what's the work involved in actually making this happen? So they saying that, well, Swift is talking to local POSIX storage systems anyway, just you know, XFS formatted on a drive, and ClusterFS is presenting a POSIX file system, so why was this so hard? So 
it is an ongoing work. We've, we've come a very long way, and we've still got a little ways to go, and that's part of the collaboration. But the main, focus of the, the, the main functionality focuses here are the ability to uh, make it flexible, to give people freedom to choose what kind of uh, backends they need to use behind, for storage volumes uh, behind Swift. So instead of writing the Swift code in such a way that we just assume and mix up all of the layers of abstraction such that we say, well, we know this is going to be a local POSIX file system, well now we can throw that out to a, a pluggable interface that says, well, we can actually do this. Now the gentleman standing up right here actually did a lot of the work on this, and you should ask him all of your questions, and he's going to ask me one now. Yeah, there's no, no question, but just a quick answer is the difference between uh, Swift on file... Hi, Mike. Get closer. Do I closer to the mic? mic. Just get close. Get close. Really close. Very close to the mic. Yes. Is that better? Yeah. Is that in the Swift on file, the URL for a Swift object maps directly onto your file system. That's the Whereas key. Yeah. with the current one now, what is stored in the POSIX XFS file system is not a direct mapping to the URL. So, right. Over here? So, maybe my question is along the same lines. So, essentially, what you're doing in the Swift on file is every file on the file system is now a Swift level object. Yes. Do you want do you want to repeat the question first? Yeah, I'll repeat the question here. Yeah. So the question was, does it, does it mean that every file on your on your POSIX, POSIX file system is now exposed as a Swift object directly? And the answer is yes. Yes. And here's the difference. So the question is, well, why didn't, uh, if we just have a local HTTP, you know, Etsy dub 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 or something like that, why can't we just throw Apache at it and serve up those files directly? Which you could absolutely do. And if you show me the file system that can do that with 10 petabytes of data and a trillion <laughs> objects, go for it. Um, but that's why you need something. It's, it's a matter of availability. It's a matter of scale. It's a matter of making sure that's durable to individual hardware failure and things like that. So what you're getting, that's a great question. Does, yes. the, avail does, that, do the, um, does the durability in those promises translate through this Swift on file? And the important piece here is that you get these same advantages that you had with GlusterFS if you're using GlusterFS, and you also get, those, uh, get the uh, full Swift API because you're using actual upstream code. Exactly right. Yeah, Swift on file just leverages the underlying file system. Let's so get, uh, that technology here, yeah. is just passed through. Here. Um, I, I have some concern here. Uh, since the um, Swift uh, is sacrificing the um, consistent consistency to get a high availability, but uh, underlying you get a distributed file system which is uh, a st stricter consistency. Will I think um, it, how how um, can we uh, get the uh, same level of high availability? to build Swift on top of the distributed file system? So that's a great question. And uh, I don't know if you want to answer. I've got an answer no, too. But I'm trying to understand this question again. But yeah. go ahead, you answer it. So, so basically, we've got a, an eventually consistent object storage system. And now I've got a strictly consistent distributed file system. So did I just sacrifice all my availability needs? Or you know, how, does, how do those uh, differences in uh, abstractions and understandings of the world actually affect the end user. There, there is a CAP uh, serial. Yeah. Right, exactly. So you've got the CAP theorem, so you, we didn't solve physics sort of thing. So the answer is, what do we do here? Um, one of the important I think it depends, pieces. That's the answer. Go ahead. <laughs> well, one of the important pieces is that uh, in this in this world and in in the world where you have a a Swift on file uh, storage policy that allows you to talk to GlusterFS. Yeah. In that sense. In that kind of world, Swift is not going to be doing your replication for you. Swift is just going to be able to, sorry about that. Uh, Swift is only going to be able to do the, um, uh, just the API implementation, but would only store one copy and then offload all those durability problems to, to yeah. ClusterFS in this yeah. particular instance. But then the other storage policy may be not using the Swift on file, just the normal stuff, and would still be using traditional replication or in the, in the new world of erasure codes uh, so, with storage policies. So uh, if that is true, so uh, the new, ex uh, new Swift cluster uh, provide a, a 
a strict uh, consistent model um, to the client. So, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, what you're getting is if you're using a storage policy that is throwing uh, the data into GlusterFS, then you have the semantics that are associated with GlusterFS. And if half of your uh, GlusterFS cluster is unavailable, well, then you're going to or if is, it fails, then you're going to sacrifice your uh, uh, availability because it's a strongly consistent system. That won't affect the other storage policies within Swift okay. because those will be independently um, or logical pieces. So yeah. I, th no, I was just going to say that uh, it all depends. That's what I meant by depends <laughs> uh, on how you deploy it and what your needs are and what the customer's needs are. So if you deploy it knowing that your storage policy defines that this set of data is going to go to a cluster FS system, that's what it's, it's defined. That's, that's its expectation. So you have to know where your data is moving. In other words, that's what I mean. It depends. The, the deployer of this of the storage policies has to understand that. So, yeah. okay. so it's a great Thank question. You. Makes sense. Um, question again over here. Or is there somebody that hasn't asked one yet? Just to make sure. Go ahead. So the question is capacity management. How do you add capacity in this sort of world? It's the same model, really. Um, it's just that we have now can extend on that model. For example, if you want, you have OpenStack Swift itself, you in that cluster, you would add the nodes, for example, right? But now you also have the ability to add ClusterFS or NFS or whatever FS, not just nodes to, to OpenStack. For example, if you had already some set of data in some device that exported NFS, you can now add that to also to the cluster. So it's not just about Swift adding nodes there. Now you have more choices. So in this case, uh, uh, which, uh, no, go ahead. What adding, um, are you adding multiple NFS namespaces, or would everything be one volume? So I think that uh, something very important, I, I want to reiterate it just to make sure we're very, very yet. clear, <laughs> is that when you're adding a durable storage system with Swift on file um, underneath Swift, you may still access that exactly like you were with the multi-protocol access, exactly the use case that Luis was talking about. But at the same time, that's, um, it is not exposed through Swift as a storage volume. It's not that you're going to be able to mount something. You're not going to get a POSIX interface into Swift itself for doing this. This is a way for Swift to add uh, capacity um, that has to do, it's the migration story of I've got existing capacity, I need to ingest that capacity, and then I need to continue to expand that and uh, give the flexibility that I need. So. Um, what happens is that in the current incarnation of the Gluster Swift project, um, a, uh, it, it's mapped to Gluster volumes. So it's managed exactly like you would manage Gluster volumes today. Yes. Um, in, in the brave new world of the Swift on file, it's essentially going to, it, it's really just that connector of whatever volumes are abstracted, or are presented by that file system that's what you would be adding, and, and Swift would then see this as, here's a storage endpoint that I'm in storage volume that I'm going to place data on according to the same rules that it uses for everything else. Yeah. Oh, hey. Uh, this is Trevor, RMS. Uh, I had a question with um, replication. And so I feel like Elvis uh, right now. Um, <laughs> With uh, replication, are, are the two technologies aware of each other's replication? Because both can do it. And if you wanted to replicate to a different data center, uh, would you turn one off and leave the other one on? Or are they right. aware? In some no, that's actually a great question. That's a great question. And uh, I think that's true. <laughs> Swift on file right now is, is in the process of transitioning. So that would be a great question to bring to the community so we can answer it. <laughs> but but I, I think that we don't know the answer completely to that yet. In so. general, I would say that in this case, for example, you would configure Swift to just put one replica, so to speak, inside of ClusterFS. And then Gluster is going to do its own uh, encoding of the data, replicated or not, um, and do what it needs to. Now, I think it's interesting that you brought up the concept of global clusters. And how does this work if, uh, how you, uh, in the world of global clusters? Because we know Swift has supported that for a while now, and people are using it. So if you've got, as somebody else mentioned, if you've got this strongly consistent system, then you're not really able to distribute that in a global way and keep it available. Um, that's the kind of the trade-offs that you get with that, that sort of design. 
So in this case, what you would end up with is a Gluster FS system that is in one location, but then you may have something in another location as well, but you've got Swift that's spanning the world there. So you've got one logical Swift cluster that's able to say, look, here in my Texas region is cluster FS, and over here in my Berlin region is normal traditional storage, uh, I call it traditional storage, it's, it's Swift. Um, I've been working on it for five <laughs> years now, so it's traditional to me. Um, just basically white box servers with hard drives um, that would be normal replicated storage. And then Swift can deal with, I want to distribute something globally, or I want to make sure that it's po put just on the, uh, the cluster F FS part via uh, the Swift on file project. So in that sense, we're doing, uh, we are not sharing information today. In other words, the, the deployer is choosing where do I want my replication to, uh, to happen. Last, uh, yeah, let's say last question over here, yeah. We'll be available after two if you want to. So traditionally, yeah. the, the product file system, file, uh, application access the file system, understand how to locking all those things. Into closer. So once you add this Swift interface, which is great, uh, then and it's not a POSIX uh, API. So let's say you do I/O normally still through your traditional POSIX file system, and uh, now Swift upload something which change your things on the fly, how you handle that? Right. No, so that's a great question. So I think the, the best answer that I can come up with that is really just going back to the use case and saying that, remember the use case that Luis was talking about that they were originally trying to uh, uh, solve? And it, I love, I actually really like it. It's a, the video transcoding use case. I've got a bunch of data. It's unstructured data. It grows without bound. It's getting, we've got to solve this. But I've got a tool chain that needs to figure out how to edit the video, how to transcode the video, and things like that that requires SIFs, NFS, POSIX access to the data. And I can't go rewrite all of those applications, mostly because the guy who wrote it left the company six years ago, <laughs> and I bought the other one, and I don't see the code to it. So you've got to be able to deal with this migration strategy, the client application, talking to that thing, that piece of video content. But what's really, uh, really nice about this is being able to say that now I've got the exact same storage system, and I can talk to it and use the standard POSIX locking semantics if I'm going through GlusterFS. Yes. But now, using the Swift on file stuff, I can expose that same object and the new objects created as a result of transcoding um, directly through to the clients via the Swift API, just like the adrift.org site, mm -hmm. in saying that I'm going to I'm going to give them a URL, a Swift URL, and the Swift URL being the standard Swift API REST-based non-locking object store object blob storage um, there. So does that clarify that a little bit yeah. on? So right, if you've got concurrent rights, I'm writing an object in POSIX and I'm writing it in Swift. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, your, your Swift on file or Gluster Swift is really a user of the file system. So yes. So the, the, the comment was saying that the Swift interface in, in the understanding here is that uh, it would be more heavily used on the, the read use case and the, and the POSIX may be more used on the write interface. And I think that is one very valid use case. I certainly wouldn't put it into that box alone. Hmm. But um, that is, in this particular case that we're talking about, yes, that is, that is a very good uh, point to make. So I want to thank you uh, for coming. I want to specifically thank Luis for presenting with me. Yeah, and if we have any questions, we will be here at the front and around in the halls this week. Thanks a lot. <laughs>